Okay, thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, Shipmates, we have a fun presentation scheduled for tonight as our first Coast Guard Tech Talks webinar of 2021. My name is Josh Gilliland and I am the chair for the Sea Scout Marketing Subcommittee. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, you to Bruce Johnson, who's going to introduce our speaker. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please ask in the Q&A and we'll do our best to answer those. And again, it's wonderful to have you here. If you're watching on Facebook, uh, we were watching comments there as well. So with that, Bruce, you have the floor. Thanks, Josh. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first Coast Guard Tech Talks workshop for 2021. These workshops are jointly sponsored by the US Coast Guard, the Coast Guard Auxiliary, and the Boy Scouts of America's Sea Scout program. My name is Bruce Johnson, and I serve as chief of the Coast Guard Auxiliary's youth programs. Our co-host is Josh Gilliland, chair of the National Sea Scout marketing team. Josh will be coordinating your questions in the third part of this program. Coast Guard Tech Talks are held monthly on the fourth Tuesday of the month at 2100 Eastern, 2000 Central, 1900 Mountain, and 1800 Pacific time. Each program focuses on a single science, technology, engineering, mathematics, or STEM topic. These topics are chosen to support the Sea Scout Advancement Program. Next month's Tech Talk workshop will be on GPS, which is Ordinary Requirement 10G. Tonight's topic is Marine Safety Equipment. Our presenter is John Fewer. Auxiliary Sector Coordinator for Coast Guard's Sector Maryland National Capital Region and is responsible for coordinating auxiliary activities as promulgated by Sector Command. John is a graduate of the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy and sailed as a licensed deck officer on merchant ships for many years. After coming ashore, he worked both domestically and in internationally in the maritime industry. Mr. Fewer joined the auxiliary in 2011 and has served in flotilla and division leadership positions. His qualifications include boat crew coxswain, qualification examiner, aides to verifi navigation verifier, instructor, vessel examiner, and assistant Coast Guard container inspector. One last thing, we've muted your microphones to make it easier for everyone to hear. If you have questions, please type them into the Zoom Q&A box. Josh will be monitoring the chat and will be sure to leave time to answer your questions. So let's welcome John Fewer. Oh, thank you very much, Bruce. Give me a couple of seconds here to get my screen share going you know this technology you know, you guys know this stuff very well but but some of us are still uh trying to get up to date with it so i hope you all can see my screen bruce can you confirm that if you could just turn your audio on one second yes you're good to go john very good well again good evening sea scouts and fellow auxiliarists i'd like to thank the sea scouts and coast guard auxiliary for giving me this opportunity to talk with you tonight about marine safety equipment that is required when you are on, underway on board a vessel, including paddle craft. Tonight, we're gonna primarily cover those parts of sections 5A, B, and C of the Sea Scout Manual that references safety equipment on board a boat. The United States Coast Guard is responsible for creating and enforcing the laws relating to safety equipment required to be on board boats navigating on U.S. waters. Those regulations are supported by state laws that normally mirror the federal regulations, while at the same time address local state requirements. Many of the references I make tonight will relate to boating regulations in the state of Maryland. Each state has its own boating regulations, and you should log into your state's Department of Natural Resources for boating safety regulations to identify any local requirements that you might have. Uh, 
Having the right safety equipment on board is important so we can react to emergencies when on the water as well as it's the law. Before we go into safety equipment that is on board, you should be aware that most states require boat operators to have completed a safe boating course. The age requirement may differ from state to state. So it's, make sure you read what is required for the state that you are boating in. So it's easy to sign up for boating courses. They are available both online and in person in most states. As you can see on the slide, there are many different organizations that can offer the courses. So I hope you sign up soon if you, have, you do not already have a safe boating certificate. The Sea Scout manual talks about different types of safety equipment we should have on board our boat when out on the water in section 5A. This slide is from Maryland Department of Natural Resources Boating Safety Requirements and lists all the safety equipment required on boats when operating on Maryland state waters. You will note the length of the vessel and type of propulsion often governs the type and quantity of safety equipment you must have on board. The regulations tell us what is required to wear a life jacket and what training is necessary to operate a boat on Maryland waters. Make sure you check for the equipment requirements in your state that you're boating in. And I encourage everyone to wear a life jacket when boating, whether it is required or not. So let's get into some of the equipment. First of all, federal and state boating regulations require vessels to be either documented by the Coast Guard or registered with the state. Normally, small pleasure boats are only required to be registered in the state that they're being used. Documented vessels are usually for larger vessels weighing five tons or more. Make sure you check the laws required relating to registering documented vessels in your state. Quite often, even documented vessels must pay a usage fee if they're operating in a particular state for a prescribed time period. A copy of the reg registration or documentation must be available when either the Coast Guard or Natural Resources Police inspects your boat when you are underway. Also, the registration number must be displayed on the forward half of the boat. A registration sticker is usually affixed next to the numbers in accordance with state requirements. Probably the most important piece of required equipment are life jackets. Wear your life jackets at all times when underway. Bad things can happen quickly, and there may not be time to reach for a life jacket as you're going overboard. More than 80% of the boating fatalities occur as a result of the boater not wearing a life jacket when an incident occurred. Many states require children less than 13 year old on boats less than 21 feet to wear life jackets as a requirement. However, your state may be different. So it's very important that you know the regulations for your state. Again, boaters can fall in the water no matter their age. So it's extremely important that we all wear a life jacket when out on the water. Now, there's basically five different types of life jackets. The naming of the types may be changed in the future. However, I'd like to show you what it, they currently are. The first type is called type one. These are the most robust life jackets and are usually used when operating in the open ocean. They have a more buoyant material in them, are designed to keep you afloat for a longer period of time and in rougher seas. Next type are type two life jackets. They come with either buoyant material secured in them or are inflatable. Type two jackets are primar primarily for inland and near shore cruising. Type three are often used during supervised activities when it can be expected that a person in the water will be rescued quickly. The life jacket assists them to stay afloat until rescue comes. However, it should be noted that many of the type three life jackets are not designed to turn an unconscious person's first 
and over in the water. Uh, this is why in many cases we still recommend wear the type two, especially if you're out on open waters. Type four throwable devices. These are usually shaped like a cushion or a ring. Most states require that type four devices are on board in addition to the life jackets that we wear. In Maryland, type four devices are required on boats 16 feet or longer. So check the regulations for your state. You'll note the slide mentions that it's not recommended that you use these devices as sitting cushions since the weight of a person will compact the buoyant material and it just will not be as efficient. Type five, these are special life jackets, such as high speed jackets that are used when water skiing. Type five jackets are often used by crew members who need to move about the boat as they do not want anything to interfere with their movements. Inflatable life jackets are becoming more and more popular since they are usually more comfortable to wear than the more traditional life jackets. You will recall the two pictures of inflatables on the previous side. A word of caution. Make sure you check the labels on the life jacket for the age and weight of a person it is designed to support. Also, keep the life jacket out of the sunlight as a CO2 cylinder might heat up and explode if it's been laying on the deck for a long time. And last of all, and maybe more importantly, check your life jacket for leaks by manually, bl manually blowing them up and confirming that it stays inflated every couple of weeks or so. There should be a whistle attached. It's hard to see someone in the water and a whistle will help to attract someone that is searching for you. Finally, I suggest you attach a light to the jacket since it will be much easier to find someone who went overboard at nighttime. Section 5C of the Sea Scout Manual tells us about three major classifications of fires that might happen on board. Class A covers wood and paper and other materials that burn easily and probably can be easily put out with water. Class B, fires are caused by flammable liquids such as oil or gasoline. Foam and dry chemicals are usually used on class B fires. CO2 can be used, but it's sometimes not as effective. Class C covers electrical fires involving wiring, including fuse boxes and appliances. Dry chemical and CO2 are the best extinguishing agents for class C fires. There's also a class D covers combustible materials, but most of these types of materials aren't found on boat. However, the best way to put these fire out if you do incur them is to either cool them uh, with, a, with a water or with a mist. If you look at this uh, slide I have, you'll see, well, gee, John, uh, you told us about A, B, and C, D, but if I'm reading this, it's kind of been moved around. Well, actually classification structures are being changed to include flammable gases and cooking oils having their own cl classification. But for the purpose of knowing the major classifications, we will focus on originally the ABC categories that I mentioned tonight. All motorized vessels are required to have Coast Guard approved fire extinguishers on board. The number and type extinguishers are dependent upon the length of the vessel and whether it has a fixed fire system in its machinery spaces. Make sure you check for the type fire extinguisher that should be used with any expiration dates on that extinguisher. Handheld fire extinguishers normally have a gauge on them to tell you whether they are still good or not. Fixed machinery Extinguishers usually need to be inspected by a qualified inspector normally every five years, depending upon the extinguishing agent that is being used. You also note on the uh, fire extinguisher to, on my right, uh, it tells you on there whether it's, what type of fire extinguisher it is, what, it, what type of fires it will put out. 
So that's very important for you to uh, know what is on your fire extinguisher so you know what it's going to uh, support you for. Also, you notice on the fire extinguisher on the right, it says it's US, US Coast Guard approved. You must have US Coast Guard approved fire extinguishers on board your boat. You should practice using a handheld fire extinguisher. Proper sequence for using it is pull the safety pin. Well, that makes sense. Aim the nozzle to the base of the fire. Squeeze the trigger. Spray the fire using sweeping motions. Don't point the nozzle in one steady direction, as the pressure will probably scatter the material that is burning and causing the fire to spread. Ignition safety switches are required on PWCs. In addition, you might recognize that many outboard motor power boats have a kill switch. The purpose of the ignition safety or kill switch is to immediately shut down the motor when the toggle is pulled out of the ignition switch. This is important if the operator falls overboard while the engine is running. Just imagine what it would be like if you fell overboard and the boat kept going, or even worse, circled around and ran over the top of you. The Coast Guard requires auxiliary coxswains on patrol boats to secure the lanyard to themselves. So the cord will pull out from the key switch and shut off the motor if the operator falls overboard. So it's important that you attach that cord to your body uh, because if you fall overboard and the cord's just hanging there, nothing's going to change. The boat's going to keep on going. Back flame arresters. Gasoline engines in confined spaces can give off vapors when operating, causing the engine to backfire and cause an explosion. The flame arresters are designed to prevent the engine backfiring and are required on all internal gas engines. They are not required on outboard motors. Ventilation. Boats with gasoline engines in, in, with enclosed compartments that were built after 1 August 1980 must have a powered ventilation system. You should always run the power ventilation for at least five minutes before starting the engine. This is especially important after refueling a boat. Gas fumes often settle into the buildings and may explode when the engine started. There have been many fires at gas docks because the boat operator forgot to ventilate the fumes out of the bilges before starting the engine. Sound producing devices are important to have on board to not only comply with the navigation rules, but to send signals to other vessels of your presence and inform them of your maneuvering intentions. Remember, five short blasts on the whistle or horn is used to signify danger or you are unsure of the other vessel's intentions. There are many ways to inform another vessel about you are in distress. Here's some of the list of the standard marine devices, distress signals that are shown on page 81 of the Sea Scout Manual. And if you look down through this, you can see, uh, you can use your radio, there's code flags, distress cloths, various shapes, sound signals, various flares, flashlight. So there's a multitude of different ways of doing this. And it's up to you to make sure you have, understand what you have on board and be ready just in case. Coast Guard regulations, the Coast Guard regulations require the operator to have a minimum of three handheld or, or aerial launching flares on board. Most flares will only burn for a couple of minutes and then they are finished. While the law only requires you to have three flares, it's a good idea to keep extras on board since once they burn out, you may not have any other way of attracting attention. 
Handheld and aerial flares are normally good for three years from their date of manufacture. Both the manufacture and the expiration date are shown on the flares, as you can see on this slide. Be careful when buying flares. The store may be trying to get old, rid of old flares, especially in November and December, that will expire soon and will put them on sale. So check the expiration date before you buy. Remember, the expiration date is from the date of manufacture, not the date that you purchased the flares. In the last couple of years, the Coast Guard has approved an electronic flare for use at night. The electronic flare is battery operated and it gives off the Morse code signal SOS. One advantage of these flares is the battery operated distress signal will last much longer. I suggest that you make sure you put new batteries into the device at the beginning of each boating season because you don't want to have dead batteries when you need them. You'll notice the orange flag with black rectangle and circle painted shown on the slide. This is the day signal for distress. The Coast Guard requires a day flag to be on board if you only have the electronic flare, since the flare is hard to see in the daytime. The day flag is usually included in the box when you purchase the electronic flare. So those of you who attended the Safety at Sea Day last November 7th at the U.S. Coast Guard Station Curtis Bay may recall I demonstrated the electronic flare during the session on flares. Now I'd like to show it again tonight, as it is important for you to be aware of the capabilities and limitations of the electronic flare. First, I will activate the electronic on the fla flare on the pier so you know what I'm talking about. Here you can see me standing there uh, out of uniform and the light is flashing SOS. Well, in the daytime, close up, I guess that's pretty easy to see, isn't it? Now I'd like to uh, go to the next slide. I've positioned uh, the boat further away, and I've got two visuals that will show you the flare visibility during the daytime and at twilight. I apologize for them being so short, so please watch carefully. The one on the left is the one, if you see me standing on the deck there, you can hardly see that light. You can see it, but it's not so easy. Now let's go to the one on the right, a little bit darker. You can see me a little bit better. But at the same time, as you can imagine, in the daytime, trying to see that light from a distance would be quite difficult. Now we see them both going. You can see, you gotta look pretty hard to see it. Okay, so now it's gotten dark out. I've moved my boat about a quarter of a mile away from the pier. And let's see how well the light performs now. Uh, much better, isn't it? So much easier to see. And now you can maybe understand why uh, the day flag is required on board because even close up, you wouldn't be able to see that uh, light in the daytime. So that completes the list of safety equipment that is required on board the boat. It's especially a good idea to have safety equipment on board your boat annually inspected by the unauthorized Coast Guard Auxiliary Inspector. Uh, the Coast Guard Auxiliary can do this, U.S. Power Squadron members can do this, uh, many of the states have their own inspectors to do that. Vessels meeting all the safety requirements are usually issued a vessel safety sticker. This sticker informs everyone that at the time of the inspection, the vessel met all the federal and state rate requirements 
for operating on the water of their jurisdiction. Uh, this is the 2021 sticker uh, that we will be using this year. You'll notice it says U.S. Power Squadron on it, U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary, and Boot, Boat U.S. helps to support this. It's, it, it's easy to schedule an inspection for your boat or paddle craft by Googling, I want a vessel safety check. Just follow the instruction, instructions to request an inspection and you'll be contacted by an improved inspector. Quite often you will see vessel safety inspectors at launching ramps. That is a great opportunity to get your boat inspected. The inspector will use the attached form when inspecting your vessel. You will notice the inspection is divided up into two basic sections. The section on the left addresses the legal requirements. The section on the right goes further than just inspecting for required equipment. It gives the inspector an opportunity to discuss with the boat operator about other equipment that is useful to have on board, even if not required by law. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the ability for in-person inspections by auxiliarists in many Coast Guard districts in 2020. The Coast Guard has to take action to protect the boaters and vessel examiners. At this time, in many districts, auxiliarists are not authorized to conduct in-person vessel examinations. However, there is a virtual form available online that boat owners and operators can use to review the required and recommended equipment that should be on board their boat. In cases where all visual inspections are made, examination stickers unfortunately cannot at this time be issued by the auxiliary examiner because uh, we did not physically inspect the boat. We're all hoping that this will change as the vaccination process rolls on. As you know, paddle, paddle craft are quite different from most boats. The Coast Guard has prepared a separate safety equipment checklist that is specifically focused on paddle craft. Paddlers are reminded to always wear their life jackets properly. Make sure you read the instructions which way the waist pack should face if that is the type life jacket that you, you're using. So I wanna thank you for this part of the presentation. And I, I have a little um, uh, exercise for you today. And I'd like you to think about the vessel safety inspection that we uh, just talked about. And I'd like to suggest to you that you create your own pre-underway checklist. Every boat is different. The safety requirements are the same, but we're, the number of equipment that is required on your boat, uh, making sure you have your documentation on the boat, your registration on the boat. These are all important items when you get underway. Uh, equally important, just as we do in the Coast Guard Auxiliary, before we get underway, we go through this checklist with our crew members. It helps us to make the familiar, the crew members familiar with the boat they're gonna be on. In an emergency, you want them to know where the fire extinguishers are. You want them to know uh, where any of the extra life jackets might be. We're always wearing our life jacket, but there's times that we may have to throw a life jacket or a life ring to somebody who's in the water. And so we need to uh, make sure all of our crew members know where the safety equipment is, the flares, the first aid kits, things of that nature. So I want to say thank you now, uh, and I'm opening up the floor for questions. Uh, but before I do that, I can't say it enough. Wear your life jacket. Please wear your life jacket. Bruce, I turn the uh, audio back over to you now. Thanks, John. Um, 
I wanted to mention something that uh, everybody should be aware of. Uh, bo the Boy Scouts of America requires that all Sea Scout vessels receive annual vessel safety checks. And they don't have to get it from the Coast Guard Auxiliary. They can get it from America's Boating Club, uh, the US Power Squadron, or any of the other authorized agencies to do it. But um, this is required to be done annually. And there was a really great question about uh, the virtual safety uh, vessel safety check. Um, I just Googled that and I posted the address for that in the Q&A box. Uh, Josh, did you want to uh, work on questions? Happy to. So uh, we do have one that's on Facebook, and that is, are crash blankets widely used? And I'm not sure if he means collision mat by that, but uh, John, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, we always carry blankets on board our boat, our boats. Uh, if, if somebody is, falls into the water or there's an accident, we have to help them. There's a good chance that uh, they're cold, they've been wet. Uh, and hypothermia can set in very quickly, even in the summertime. So we use the blankets. Uh, we carry various types on board to uh, assist our uh, people. Now, you mentioned that we should take either an in-person or, or online boater operator course. How long is that course a certificate good for? That course is good for a lifetime uh, because once you get your boating certificate, and again, I always reference this, check with your state regulations, but most states that is a lifetime boating certificate and by the way, it's recognized from state to state. So if you took it, let's say in the state of Maryland, chances are it, if you need to have a safe boater operator's uh, certificate in Michigan when you're boating, they might accept it. They may say, well, now that you live here, you're going to have to uh, get a state of Michigan safe boating. But the certificate itself is a lifetime certificate we do recommend every couple of years you do a little refresher. Just go back and take the course again. Sit down on that rainy afternoon. It's amazing what we can all learn. Excellent. Now, we do have a couple questions about uh, jack lines and safety harnesses and single handed boat sailing. Uh, can you share any wisdom about that? Especially on sailboats, uh, you know, safety harnesses can be a must sometime. Uh, the sailboats, you're heeling over, you, you are in some rough water, water's coming on, and it's easy to slip and fall overboard. And those safety harnesses may be what keeps you from getting away from the boat. I'd like to say that on most motorboats, we don't use safety harnesses. Uh, not that we can't, uh, especially on high speed boats, we may be using them. But on our regular pleasure boats, we usually do not use safety harnesses. So we have a life jacket question. And that is if you could only have one type of life jacket uh, on board a vessel, uh, what kind should it be? And I think this will probably be determined by what kind of water uh, somebody's operating on. Yeah, that's correct. If you recall the early slides I had on the type one, type two, type three, type five uh, life jackets, it's really what is the use you're going to use them for? Uh, we always recommend, though, that you have, uh, if you're going to do inland waters, you still have some type two on board. Uh, if you're going to go offshore, have the type one on board. Uh, that, that open water, uh, it may take a day or two before you're found, I hate to say it. And as long as you haven't uh, suffered from hypothermia, having that type one life jacket uh, may be the one that made the difference. Could, could I add a couple of things to that answer? 
Uh, one is that you need to make sure that you inspect your life jacket at least annually to ensure that it is in good serviceable condition. No life jacket lasts forever. And if the life jacket has gotten beaten up, sun bleached, or whatever, it may lose its ability to do its job. So you want to make sure that you check it to make sure that it's still going to work. The other thing is to remember that you need to buy life jackets that are comfortable enough that you're actually going to wear them. Uh, a, a life jacket that isn't worn is of no value to anybody. So if you have to spend a little bit more to get a life jacket that you're comfortable wearing, that's money really well spent. Yeah, Bruce, that's absolutely right. And, you know, most of us, when we go buy our, our uh, dresses, our pants, our shirts in stores that we can try them on, we will try them on for size as well as whether we think it fits well and looks well on us. Trying a life jacket on for size is very important. Uh, just like so many of the clothing we buy, uh, it's a size 40 regular versus a size 40 uh, uh, loose or something like that. They're different. Yes, they have straps on them that you can tighten and slack them up. But especially underneath the arms where you have to be moving, you want to make sure you have the freedom. But at the same time, it's snug enough so that if you go in the water, it stays close to your body. Let's uh, talk about inflatable life jackets. Those have arming devices. How long are those arming devices generally good for? Uh, repeat, I didn't hear that as well, Josh. So uh, with inflatable life jackets, they normally have an arming device. How long is that arming device normally good for? Well. Most of the arming devices are good for five years. But having said that, with all of your equipment, read the instructions that come with it when you buy it. Uh, also, you will find on some of the arming equipment, it'll give you an expiration date. And so uh, make sure you check the equipment you're buying so you know in advance when you're gonna have to replace the arming device. How will you know? Uh, all of those things, if all else fails, read the directions. So there's a, always the fun question of what do you do with uh, expired flares? In the San Francisco Bay Area at our safety at sea, we do flare launching uh, as part of the training. So we, we deputize those and as a way to help uh, uh, the community uh, dispose of expired flares. But for those who don't have that option, how can people get rid of expired flares? Well, one of the things I try to do is work with our Coast Guard stations that we have a training day once a year and we collect all of the old flares and we bring them as part of the training because the Coast Guard puts a notice out that there's gonna be a training exercise. So when people see flares going off of the air and not all calling the police and the Coast Guard, et cetera, about it. But also in some areas, uh, like in the state of Maryland, some of our counties, you can take expired flares to the fire department and they will take them and they take them and then they destroy them. Uh, we find when we do f testing of flares, we do flare exercises, uh, sometimes only 30% of the expired flares are still working. So this reinforces why how important it is to make sure you do not have expired flares on your boat. Actually, to, uh, to clarify that you're required to have unexpired flares on your boat, you may want to have expired flares, but you certainly want to inspect them to make sure that they don't appear to be damaged. And the Coast Guard recommends that you store them separate from the uh, unexpired flares. Correct. Excellent. Uh, well, that seems to conclude our questions for this evening. There were a couple, there were a couple of uh, questions that were in the Q&A box that we've uh, answered uh, um, uh, in written form, but I think they're worth sharing with the group. 
One was an interesting question about whether there's any movement for a national voter safety uh, training certification uh, and for a national boat registration. I haven't seen anything along those lines. I think the closest to a national boater registration is the documentation of boats that the Coast Guard does for the larger boats. Uh, each of the states have their own requirements uh, for the right reasons. Uh, when you're motorboating up in Michigan, some of the requirements up there for October and November are a lot different than down in Florida or in Hawaii or Los Angeles, Texas. And so retaining a, the state requirements who are focused on what is the needs of the boaters in their region probably is the way it'll stay for a time. The closest we're getting, I think, is the uh, boating vessel inspection checkoff sheet that we went through tonight, uh, but not for registration purposes other than the documenting of vessels. As for the boater safety education certification, um, not all states require it, although most of them do at this point. The thing that you want to look for is uh, a card that's going to be accepted most everywhere is uh, for a course that was NASBLA approved. That's National Association of Boating, uh, National Association of Safe uh, of state boating law administrators. Sorry, um, if it's it has mouthful. that, if it has that logo, it will probably be accepted in most states. And that's why I can't emphasize enough, uh, everybody. Uh, check your local uh, state regulations. It's easy to do. Just Google them for your state, and they'll tell you everything you need to know. And if you're going to be boating in another state. Uh, take the time to check if there's any differences in that state's regulation compared to what you're used to in your state. That may be very important with taking boating safety courses. In some states, maybe they require you, like here in the Maryland, anybody born after July 1st of 1972 has to have taken a boating operator's safety course. That may not be the same other states, but if you are come from California and you decide to do some boating on the Chesapeake Bay, remember you need to conform to the Maryland regulations for safe boaters while you're on our waters. Boat US has a really good summary of the state boating requirements. So go to the Boat US website and uh, you can get a quick and easy uh, summary of what is required in each state. Fantastic. Uh, John, your expertise and uh, time are greatly appreciated this evening. Uh, this has been extremely informative and want to thank everyone for attending. We have webinars coming up in February and includes one with a, a marine archaeologist. Uh, he worked on the team that found the USS Nevada uh, in 16,000 feet of water. So this is going to be Cool, for all the nerds out there who love ROVs, this one's for you, check it out. And then we have uh, another Tech Talks at the end of February on the 23rd. Bruce, can you tell us about that? That's gonna be on GPS and that will uh, relate to uh, ordinary requirement 10G. And I'm sorry, I can't remember who the speaker is, but uh, it will be uh, somebody who really knows what they're talking about. And we have all of the webinars posted on cscount.org if they're on the calendar. Uh, we also have a special page created listing all of them for all of 2021 that we have scheduled so far through June. Check back there frequently uh, as we finalize speakers in March and April um, in the latter half uh, of the year as well. So we have a robust webinar schedule. And if there's topics you wanna to see, email us. Uh, we're happy to make sure that we are delivering content that's relevant and helpful for all of our Sea Scouts uh, across the country. So with that, 
John, Bruce, thank you for your time. And everyone, stay safe and stay healthy. Fair winds. Thank you.